for a sign. Um, Toronto development has been called Manhattanism, I think in a very derogatory way. Um, Rem Coolhouse, and in his book with Bruce Mao, talked about it in a very positive way. I think as city builders, we can intensify our cities at all scales of development, from the extra small to the double XL uh, or hyper dense. And I don't think Toronto uh, is any exception um, to that pattern. Um, as Richard pointed out, the population of the world will, in my lifetime, triple from three to nine billion people, if I live that long. And uh, over a billion people, um, from one billion to six billion people will be the increase in the urban, um, in living in cities over that time frame. And I think Toronto uh, will experience that similar growth. Ever since technology has permitted it, and I think architects have been dreaming about these uh, skyscrapers, Frank Lloyd Wright in the 1950s, and very much of the optimism of the 1950s, came up with a concept for a 528 floor building at 10 feet each, it was a mile high, obviously never built. Um, but flash forward to uh, where buildings have got with new technology. In uh, Dubai, the Burj, at 829 meters tall and 163 floors. I'm not so sure that Dubai is actually a great example of the future of cities. These kind of buildings in that climate and their public realm and public spaces and pedestrian realm is virtually non-existent when you walk around Dubai. It's very hard to walk around Dubai, in fact. Cities like Chicago have always embraced um, the tall, the super tall, and I think spectacular architecture. Um, the city planners, the mayor, everyone encourages these kind of buildings. Calatrava Spire Building, unfortunately not built at uh, 150 floors, I think was a spectacular addition to the Chicago uh, skyline. Uh, in New York, uh, Raffaele Vignoli uh, designed this building and it's recently completed at 1400 feet high. It's the tallest residential building in the Western Hemisphere. I think New York is a city that allows encourages and embraces buildings like this and has the transit and culture and people and politics to support it. I think Toronto's warming up to the idea. Um, on West 57th Street, it's now referred to as Billionaire's Row in New York. Um, two buildings, uh, one recently completed on the left and now one proposed, are between 1,000 and 1,300 feet tall. Um, the price of land in Toronto is about 50 to 100 bucks a square foot. In Manhattan, it's now $1,000 a square foot for every square foot of density. Um, it's no exception in other cities, it's also happening. The Shard in London at 87 stories is an incredible mixed-use project, a retail, hotel, and office. It's unimaginable 20 or 25 years ago to think that London would have buildings of this scale and this modernity. I remember Prince Charles uh, deriding these kind of buildings. But I think it really speaks to London's place in the world and where, it's, where it sees itself over the next centuries. Um, Toronto is now getting this kind of hyper-dense, double XL uh, kind of architecture. Gary and Mervish's three, now two towers on King Street at over 90 floors. There was so much hand-wringing at City Hall about this. and I think we ought to celebrate the bombastic and the daring and the avant-garde and not water it down and be meek about it. Um, it's not for every city, though. It's not for every part of every city. The hyper-dense multi-towers on a podium that we've seen in, in, the, in the Far East for many years is now arriving in Toronto. Five towers uh, of up to 90 floors on one retail podium at the foot of Young Street in the old Toronto Star uh, office building location by uh, Hilary Pontrini Architects. Um, the city of Toronto has this what I call the box, the Tall Buildings Guidelines box, um, from Spadina to Jarvis, from Bloor to the Lake. It's really changed over the last 20 years, and I think it's going to continue to change. You know, Toronto is one of the fastest growing cities uh, in, in North America and the most activity uh, in the world for high rise. I think it could expand a little further east and a little further west. Um, but it's not for every part of the city. You know, Toronto is a city of 175 neighborhoods, such as the Danforth. But underneath this road is a subway, and I don't think this kind of density necessarily justifies building new transit. These areas will have to get a little more dense. But it's not an easy task in Toronto. But I think more at the small and medium scale it is uh, achievable. I think as developers, we're a pretty creative lot and we can find places to build. Uh, 14 units on top of an existing office building on top of retail uh, on Bloor Street. I think this is an incredibly beautiful collection uh, of villas uh, in the sky. Not a cheap place to live, but I think a very interesting kind of infill development uh, project. Um, the next two uh, projects are on transit lines. In fact, they're right at transit stations, and they're between 8 and 12 stories high. I think they're very elegant, modern, and well-crafted buildings that step down to their residential neighborhoods. But the hue and cry and the OMB um, battles that, to get these approved was just remarkable. It astounds me in this city that we have this kind of fight at transit nodes. Um, but I really like the place that we're in right now in Toronto, and you know, we're getting these info projects of sometimes eight or 10 or 12, 15 units in one building. They're not cheap to build, um, and, and they're very complex building. This is Peter Fried's uh, project on Wellington Street, and I think it's terrific. Um, 
And these, this next building on uh, Davenport, um, but I'm speaking too quickly, this building on uh, Davenport, it's um, only six units in a seven-story high building. And the units range in size from uh, 2,000 square feet all the way up to 6,000 square feet. Um, I think we'll be building more and more of these in Toronto, and I think they're great examples of how we can infill into existing neighborhoods um, and create uh, more and more residential housing downtown. This is a remarkable little building called the Flower Box House in uh, New York's uh, East Village, um, Lower East Side, and there are only five units in uh, five floors. This area is called Alphabet City, and about 10, 15 years ago, it was a real no-go zone. Um, today, you know, hipsters and families uh, live here. Uh, quite a transformation. You know, in Toronto and Montreal, we've had kind of a long history of uh, walk-up apartments in Montreal, three and four stories high. And in the middle of neighborhoods, even neighborhoods like Rosedale, we used to build these three and four story wood frame apartment buildings, and they do fit in to their context and the scale. And I'd like to see more of these. This is where I think families will live, long before they'll live in very tall towers with 500 units. And one of my favorite architects right now is uh, Stanley Seidowitz in San Francisco. These are four and five story high buildings made out of wood. They're clad in curtain wall and sheets of uh, uh, perforated aluminum. Stanley Sider was one who designed these, he's the builder and developer of them because no one wanted to build them. He took the risk and built them himself. And all the way down at the XS, uh, X small scale, the, the micro, the, the laneway houses, you know, we have these really deep lots in Toronto. But what you have to go through to build one of these is unbelievable. But I think more of this would be great. This is where families can live. There are schools, there are parks nearby. So our cities will continue to grow. They'll be the center of culture, finance, education, healthcare, et cetera. And Toronto will continue to grow. And I'm optimistic that all forms of developments, from the extra small to the XXL and hyper-dense, will be all be a part of it. Thank you.